Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's up, folks? Yep, it's that time. It's time for an exciting episode of the Rich Redmond Show. This one's long overdue. Of course, I say that all the time because I have so many musician friends, but this one is long overdue because today's <laughs> guest, we moved to Nashville. This is my Nashville family. We're going to talk about that today. The drumming family will all move within a couple of weeks of each other and i get this gentleman all to myself today usually i'm joined by jim mccarthy my co-host co-producer jim mccarthy voiceovers.com we'll get into that because we have that in common with our guest today as well some voiceover action but let's get into it uh, hailing from concord north carolina calling nashville home since 1997 and since 2019 has been the touring drummer with hank williams jr and that's just the tip of the iceberg he's also played with gary allen mark chestnut heidi newfield kelly pickler catch your breath lover boy uh little texas jeff bates aaron tip and chris knight trent tomlinson shannon lawson ricky van shelton mitch malloy marty ray the list goes on and on our friend <laughs> lee kelly what's up pal yeah, I can't keep a job. That's the joke of people who've been here this long, right? <laughs> you're, you're being way too hard on yourself, man. That's great. It's an amazing, it's amazing resume. You and I are, are are sitting here catching up in a public forum. You got your boom boom drum room. I got crash studio here. I'm sure you're staring at piles of drum kits and snare drums sourced from around the world, same as me. <laughs> we did the thing, man. So. I know that from reading your bio, you moved to Nashville on a very specific date, January 11th, 1997. Is that right? Yep. Now, for me, I knew it was February or March, and I don't know. I'd have to ask Jim Riley because we that is our grad. This is our graduating class. Me, right. you, Jim Riley, who went on to Rascal mm -hmm. Flatts fame, uh, Pat McDonald, who went on to yep. play with Charlie Daniels, uh, God rest his soul, Charlie Daniels. And was there someone else in the mix there? Like, you know, William Ellis was kind of coming up a little bit with us, but that was about the big four right there. right? Yeah, I think William was already here. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And playing, I can't remember the band he played with, but the band he played with used to come through Charlotte. I never saw him, but I remember the band name, like playing in our neighborhood. You know, neighborhood clubs or whatever. So, yeah, Taylor, man. So, yeah. So we, so we, you know, we took that first step, which is, you know, the big step. That is the biggest step, and it requires the most bravery and conviction. And it really is, you know, you could do anything in any chapter in any season of your life, but. You know, when you're in your 20s or your 30s, you know, you still have that like piss and vinegar and you're like, I'm going to show them I'm going to do the thing. I'm going to go to the watering <laughs> hole. What was your background and why did you say, all right, it's time for Nashville? Well, I <clears throat> grown up playing drums, but it wasn't really a vocation that my parents or saw as a vocation. Right. So my education with it kind of stopped at high school. And then I still played to records and stuff in college. If I had a chance to set my drum kit up in a band room or in a dorm room or something, I would. <clears throat> and then toward the end of college, a friend of mine, there was a band I followed around called Sugar Creek for a few years yeah. when I was a teenager and they were, they had done star search. Um, and, you know, they yeah. were kind of local, you know, local regional heroes. Yeah. It would you know put out their own records and stuff, so they'd do a combination of originals and covers and do an hour and a half set break, an hour and a half set, and it was like seeing a an arena concert in a club every time you saw these guys. Fantastic. Well, they broke up. The keyboard player put together a new band called Too Much Sylvia, and I was the original drummer. Actually, the drum heads right there. Now was it uh, too? There's uh, too much Sylvia or. It's too much, Sylvia. There's too much, Sylvia. <laughs> or, it where was, does the emphasis go on the syllable? Well, we started as a melodic rock band. So a we were years writing, too late, right? Exactly. Well, right, as, right before Nirvana hit. Oh, we yeah. started in 89 or 89 and 90. Wrote 10 songs, had them on a cassette, did... A bunch of covers like Black Crows, Mr. Big, Yes, uh, and some other stuff. Played a few gigs like that. Nirvana hits and changes the landscape completely. 
It sounds so like the tale band. of giant. Yeah, for real. I'm telling you, I was a big fan of of those guys as right. well. Yeah, you know, and it just changed the landscape as you remember as well. And so, in his genius, Rick Lee, the leader of the band, who had been running bands since 1968, uh, he said, "Let's make it a variety band." So we still played rock, but it became like it led toward the beach band circuit and playing some of that stuff, the Carolina beach band stuff, the variety stuff, stuff that was sequenced with horns and percussion. So you know, playing with a click and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, triggering pads, you know, like everybody does now, but back then it was just an octopad too, just triggering sounds. Yeah. Um, then spent about four years in that band as the original drummer until it was like, okay, I got to change. And then I played with a few blues bands and other bands around that area. And then, uh, played in one band. that was kind of like a Jimmy Buffett variety band. So it was everything. Jimmy Buffett, little feet, almond brothers, all that stuff. And, but that band wanted a singing drummer. So they wanted more harmonies. I mean, they had three-part harmony and four-part harmony sometimes if the bass player chimed in. But they wanted a singing drummer, so they wanted to make a change. And a friend of mine went, hey, our buddy that used to live here, a bass player named Ron Cheek, now rest his soul, he's been passed a while. Wow. He had already moved to Nashville. This drummer friend of, of mine uh, named Frank Sorrell, he goes, Let's go to Nashville for a week and check it out. And that was like August of 96. Very smart. Yeah. And well, okay, sure. You know, we came in on a Sunday afternoon and the first place we went was the Boardwalk Cafe. <laughs> which is which became 16th Avenue Shoe Warehouse. And now uh, it's something the, else, right? Uh, no, the Boardwalk Cafe was the one on Nolensville. Oh, yeah. That was the first place I played, too, at a jam session with Casey Lutton, hosted by yeah. Casey Lutton. Yeah, remember the soundboard was over there in the corner next to the pool Popcorn table? Popcorn machine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, the one you're thinking about, which is where you and I actually met, was 16th Avenue Cafe that was owned by, owned by Rick and Joyce Tiger. Yes, and we watch Mike Kennedy play all the time. God rest his soul. Well, and funny enough, the first band that we saw at the boardwalk on that Sunday in August of 96 was Mike Brookshire and the Starving Hounds. But instead of Kennedy playing drums, it was Steve Cummings on drums. Steve Cummings is still here kicking it around town, man. I haven't seen him in 15 years. Has he, have you ever run into him? I I just follow. I see what he does on Facebook, and I keep meaning when he does those uh, Bowen shows, the Jimmy Bowen things. Yeah, out at Music Valley, I need to go drop in on him because he was a big, you know, like a big cheerleader. Of, yeah, you know, sat in and how hey, you'll work that kind of thing. Yeah, and Frank and I sat in everywhere we went. We sat in there. We sat in at the Broken Spoke. We sat in at Barbara's when Steve Meesamore was playing there. Steve was a cheerleader. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, sat in at Gabe's and when we sat in at Gabe's, there was a bass player named Brenda Clark who, you know, went on play with some other people and she played with older artists back then. Yeah. Uh, after we, after I played one song with her, a shuffle, an old country shuffle, she looks at me and goes, do you live here? And I said, no, but I'm thinking about moving. And she goes, gave me your number and goes, Okay, when you move here, call me and let me know you're here so I can hire you. I was like, okay. So you're so getting work. Another... You don't even live there and you got work. Well, yeah, it's, it's, so it was encouraging. And then also along those lines, Eddie Bears had done that thing in Modern Drummer where somebody asked him to critique his playing. And he said, oh, I really can't. His answer, Eddie's answer was, I really can't critique it without hearing you. So send me a tape, and he graciously opened it up to all the readers of Modern Drummer, where it was, if you want to send me a tape for me to critique your playing, send it to Muddy Pit Studios in Nashville. Wow. I, owned. I don't remember that. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it was somewhere in the mid-90s. So I put together a tape of, like, you know, pulled audio off of video stuff I'd had and a couple of things, and sent it to him, and he was nice enough to write, you know, you know write back a 
a little note and a signed note that basically said, Hey, if you move here, you'll work. Uh, make sure you able to get a day gig. Like we all had to. Yes. And you can use me as a reference. And I went, okay, that's I'm going Lee. And that then, is crazy. Cause I did the same thing. I didn't do it through modern drummer, but somehow I got Eddie's information and uh, Eddie and Lonnie got a rich Redmond cassette. <laughs> and it had me covering all styles from Motown to Fusion and everything in between. And he did the same thing. Hey, kid, you'll do fine. Be part of the community, support the community, and let me know if you need a reference. How cool. He took the Isn't time great, to do it. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. And then we end up, you know, January 96 and February and March of 96, we all show up. <laughs> Okay, so what have you been doing since? And go. Uh, <laughs> we're just talking about how did 25 years come and go? But I love this story of a shuffle because I've been consuming some of the interviews are that out there that exist. You're, you know, the Working Drummers podcast and stuff because I was like, there's 25 years have gone by, long periods of time. Well, I won't see Lee. Let me kind of bone up on some of the things that are they're happening in his life. And you're telling me about this story with Gary Allen and how you went to this audition. I remember going to that audition and thinking to myself, now, if we're going to do shuffles, they probably want like aggressive, like, like cheap trick, like shoulder on the ride symbol, like, like rim shots. And, and anyways, I don't know if it was the right approach. It wasn't because you, your shuffle got you the gig. Was Gary Allen your first job? Was that the first job you got? It was the first artist gig. Yeah. Your shuffle now got you the job, buddy. Well, honestly, I'm glad we get to talk about this because I didn't think I'd get the gig because I knew you were auditioning. I'm like, oh, Rich will get it. I'll oh, forget, it. you know. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, and also, when I don't know if you remember, but when you listen to Gary's first album, it's so country. It's so it traditional. Is, yeah, I mean, even that to the second album, it would be you was a change. Big time. And then, of course, the smoke rings was a drastic and fantastic change for him, you know, musically. Yeah. But I listened to the first record and listened to that song that you're talking about, the the one that we all started with, I'm sure, Send Back My Heart. Da, 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 And I remember Gary had us all bring our drum sets in, which was weird. What were you playing at the time? Because I was, I was probably over the top with my black smoky black yamaha kit with the gold turrets you know the weckle oh yeah the like the maple customs maple customs yeah i remember you still you always played one up and two down i remember that yeah and i was playing an aot kit at the time two up and well two up and two down or two up and one down yeah on a rack which after I got the gig, it quickly went away because Gary's like, that's not really the look I'm looking for. And I'm like, I, I get it. That's cool. You know, so switch back to modular stands from that. But <laughs> the shuffle thing, it is funny because we played the song, you know, set up. Nobody says much of anything to each other because they're sizing you up and you're over there trying to get your stuff together, you know, and. Okay, I'll be right. I'll be fast, guys. Hold on a second. You know, yeah, the auditions putting, are crazy, especially yeah, if you have your putting, own gear. Yeah, yeah, and you're putting your erector set together, and, and also even if you do one with a house kit, you're having to move the erector set around to get it close enough. And it's kind of like dead air on radio. You feel like you're just, oh man, this is you know, this is taking forever. And we played the song, and nobody said a word. Except for Ali O'Shea, the fiddle player, who <laughs> always kind of equate him to Kramer from Seinfeld. Is he still around? He's, he's he's not around Nashville, but he is in Taos, New Mexico. Oh, artsy scene, man. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's been out there for quite a while. And I know he plays with Michael Martin M Michael Martin Murphy quite yeah. a good bit. So ah. he stays busy out there. You know? He was very wiry, and, skinny looking dude, almost like a Kenny G meets Kramer, right? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, 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 and and, and kind of wore the same kind of, um, you know, like slacks and stuff. Had the same kind of vibe. Yeah. Um, and Ollie was the guy who was responsible for introducing Jim Lauderdale to whoever he introduced Jim to to launch Jim's career. Like they were working together somewhere in Chicago, and 
Ollie knew somebody's like, you got to check Lauderdale out, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, wow. But nobody says a word, and Ollie just looks at me and goes, hey, kid, nice tits. And I'm like, what What does that mean? Yeah, what is that know. to this day? Do we know what that means? No idea. So, so, so you know. So maybe we just, ask Brian Arsenault. I wonder if Arsenault knows. I just had lunch with him after not seeing him for like six years the other day. Oh, cool, man. Yeah, it was cool. And he's still there. I mean, he was hired while I was still in the band. Yeah. Um, and actually, uh, I saw them in 2017 <clears throat> when I started playing with Kendall Marvel. And Kendall had co-written right where I need to be. Ah. He's co-written a bunch of stuff, but Kendall became an artist at that point. Yeah. And we opened for Gary. And they sounded so great. Like, Back when we auditioned for him and I played for him, it was a guitar band. There were no keyboards. Right. In fact, uh, John Lancaster. Oh, who yeah. Passed, yeah. Uh, on this gig, John asked me, he goes, so were you in the band when Mike Webb was playing keyboards? I said, no, I was in the band when Gary hated keyboard players. But there <laughs> wasn't any. Right. So all the guitar players were doing, you know, keyboard parts. But then when I saw him in 2017, I think I told Jeff Jackson and I told Gary, I said, that was amazing. I said, that was the band I always wanted. <laughs> I, it's interesting. Was that when Larry Babb was playing drums? Yeah, Larry's. I think Larry's still there. Dude, Larry is um, a, a secret gem, an un mm -hmm. underrated gem of Nashville. Like I saw that dude play with Big and Rich and they've had a lot of great drummers. And like, you know, Keo, Keo will even admit it. He's like, dude, that guy played that gig perfectly. It was like, um, it was just perfect. I mean, it was just like, that is a flawless drumming. You know what I mean? I was mm -hmm. like, where, and where are you? Um, he never gets out because he's nope. practicing eight hours a day, still in his fifties. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, yeah. We had a uh, dinner, one of those dates back then and He's like, yeah, man, I'm still practicing. I'm like, my gosh. Please stop. And, and Gary's like, hey, come by the bus, you know, after the gig. And so as I'm walking out of the door, there goes Larry. He's gone. <laughs> it's going to practice. So, yeah. Yeah. That's Just crazy. Hang, you know, but, yeah, yeah you know. Kendall Marvel was the only name I really wasn't familiar with on the list. But oh, okay. So he was a writer that got a record deal, but he would do these honky tonk nights. It was, it was kind of like a. Was it like a variety show where you had guests and things or? Well, his thing uh, started before I joined him. It's called the Kendall Marvel, Kendall Marvel honky tonk experience yeah. that he started at the exit Inn, And he was a writer that was around the time he moved to town. In fact, his first co-write was right where I need to be. Yeah. Like second day in town, he wrote that song and that was a hit that he gave a lot to his dad ah. from it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For, nice. you know, helping him out. He said, man, if I ever write a hit, you know, we'll settle up. And he happened to write it the day after he moved to town. Yeah. But he was a writer throughout, um, the late nineties and two thousands. Um, most recently he's written a lot of stuff with brothers Osborne. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, well, and was Chris Stapleton. In fact, either way, uh, that's him and Kendall is Stapleton and Kendall Marvel. So that's one of Grammy. Uh, and then what was the one with brothers Osborne? They just did, uh, Oh, younger me. Ah, the, uh, and that's Kendall Marvel co-write. Nice. So he's still in the mix. Oh the yeah. Yeah. And Kendall's out playing. In fact, he opened three or four shows for us with Hank last year. Yeah. Um, and, and, He's kind of the reason I got the Hank gig because he would hire, if he augmented the four piece band, he would hire a steel player. And if he hired a steel player, it was either Cowboy Eddie Long from the Bama Band era yeah. or Mike Daly, who's been there now 27 years. Mike Daly, okay. first steel player I ever shared a stage with. I had never met a steel guitar player because, you know, coming really? from the Dallas scene. Mm -hmm. A lot of saxophones, a lot of, <laughs> you know, a lot of electric guitar rippers. You know what I mean? Not a lot of steel guitar. 
Well, no, you didn't I, do the country scene in, well, in Dallas. I, I take that back. I did play with a cat named Milo Deering, who is the fiddle mandolin steel king of Dallas, Texas. And that's him playing on the theme song to Motel 6. You know, we'll leave the light on for you. <laughs> yeah. So that was like some of my experience. But, you know, in Dallas was all about the saxophone, you know, like Sergio, the shirtless saxophone player. <laughs> La- and, and now we don't play with uh, any saxophone players in, in Nashville. It's all steel guitar. Yeah. Yeah, Which is man. one of the most beautiful instruments, period. Yeah. It's a it's weapon. It's a weapon in the wrong hands, but a beautiful instrument if you know how to do it. And tell me if I'm wrong. I don't know if you noticed this, but most steel guitar players are advanced in age because it is a mature person's instrument that takes some time to figure out. Oh yeah, it's you're wrestling an alligator, <laughs> <laughs> kind of on a piano. Yeah, yeah. It's it, but it's it's wonderful when it's in the right hands. Yeah, man. Yeah. And, yeah. And in fact, uh, yeah. It's, uh, and so us leaving a Kendall Marvel rehearsal where Kendall was also changing a couple of band members. So I was kind of calling the shots of what we were running through. Oh, okay. Back to the guest thing. His honky tonk experience <clears throat> was and is whenever he does it, he's doing it sparingly now because of, you know, he's busier on the road and stuff like that. Uh, but it would be playing Kendall's originals off the first record at the time. Now he's got three albums out. But at the time, it was just off the first record that he did with God Rest His Soul, Keith Gaddis. We're talking about a lot of people that have passed on today, right? It's wow. I know. Oh, dude, it, you know, and yeah, there was another one today. Ronnie Stoneman, you know, passed was, away today. I'm, I well, was... Ronnie Stoneman, the banjo player from the Stoneman family, and also uh-huh. she was a she was on Hee Haw. Oh wow! The the, the lady with the gap teeth. Oh wow! Okay. Mm-hmm. She was one of the people on Hee Haw. Uh, but Kendall, we'd play Kendall's originals, and then Kendall would have guest singers come out. Like he'd have Randy Hauser come out. He'd have a main guest, and he'd have other ones peppered through the night. But the main guest would do like three or four songs, maybe four or five. And then the other people sitting in, everybody had to do country covers. That was the criteria. You couldn't do originals. Uh, Gary did, when Gary sat in, Gary did originals because of the co writer right where I need to be. And he did, I think, one other, I think he did watch, we did watching airplanes. And then he did country covers other than that, but he also brought, half of his band. And then when he said, who's, you know, who's on drums, he's the league is, Oh, that's fine. I, he'll know my stuff. <laughs> right. That's perfect. Um, so we would, <clears throat> sometimes we rehearse it the day of the show at the exit in, mm-hmm. but this particular time, um, when we actually got a rehearsal room, uh, and went through the tunes and had the guests come over and sit in, uh, and we were changing band members, changing guitar player and, and bass player. And I'd also started road managing Kendall by that as well, by that time as well. For so a little extra, in, little extra cash. Oh, for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Double. <laughs> I love that. So you just got to make sure that everybody uh, gets fed, gets to bed and gets paid. Yeah, pretty much. Make yeah. sure you, you put everything, you set everything up, you know, going into it that way. The day runs smooth because you've already put it all together. It just has to be set in motion and do that. Put out fires, yeah. Right. And you you work with great road managers and oh, yeah. you look to them like, okay, they know what's going on, you know, so yeah. you learn. But this particular one, I was kind of calling the shots, okay, let's run this, let's run this, blah, blah, blah. Kendall, what do you else do you want to run? And being steel and drums and steel guitar and drums and having all the gear that we have, Mike and I were the the last one's out and daily turns to me and said, Hey, would you consider playing drums with Hank? And I didn't know they didn't know they were even looking, had no idea. Um, well, that's another, you know that's camp- another gig you've shared with Keo. Right. It's, uh, it, it's, this town is, it's gotten more insular where the last actual cattle call audition. I remember even hearing of was Gretchen Wilson when she blew up. Which was Every, about two thousand and three, right? Right, 
But everybody Ina had is now, hey, I know a guy. Let's take this guy out and see if he works out. See what kind of hang they are. You know, yeah, very like much that. relationship based. Not a lot of auditions happening. For sure. You know, which is fine. It's just the way it's work, worked out. And yeah. It gives us more power, actually, to create, because if we are doing the right things, checking all the boxes, we're a person of integrity, we know how to play the drums, we just sh keep showing up, our group of friends that mix business and pleasure continues to grow, and then people vouch for us, and we're not having to deal with a management company. <laughs> you know, putting their paws into like, we got to hire musicians, right? But in 1997, it was very much like I called all those management companies. Hey, I'm Rich Redman. I just moved here. Are you auditioning? I'll keep your name. Nothing right now, but I'll hold on to your number. Okay. Yeah. And even back then, the reason you and I got to audition for Gary is because of Jim Riley. Because yeah. They saw Jim play, I think, at, 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 at Wolfie's. At Wolfie's, I think. Oh, it's at Wolfie's. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they saw him play and asked him, hey, would you consider playing with us? And he had just gotten the Mark Chestnut gig. That's right. And then he recommended us. So going back even that far. And you got the Mark Chestnut gig as well. So there is a the theme <laughs> to this episode is already showing its ugly head. <laughs> it's all about relationships. Oh, well, yeah, it is for sure. Because then if you have bumps in the road, as long as you, as you said, keep showing up and doing a good job, it'll smooth back out, you know, and everything will be fine. Yeah. So Mike asked me if I'd consider joining Hank and, or, you know, giving it a thought or giving it a shot and, uh, went home and talked with my wife at the time and yeah. was, we kept, we're like, yeah, I know you're invested with Kendall, but it's Hank fucking Williams Jr. That you, you gotta see do that it. One. You didn't even see it coming. And then over the next two or three weeks, we kept it a secret from Kendall just because I didn't want him to know it. I wanted, I wanted to get it before I said anything to anybody. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to start going, Hey, I'm up for this, you know, and then it not pan out. Yeah. That just, it'd rather let's make sure it works before we say anything. And by the time I got to play with Hank, the band and crew had set it up so well that if I didn't get it, I sucked. <laughs> so what do you mean I by mean, that? Yeah. Well, I knew everybody in the band except for Jimmy Hall. So when Mike Daly went to them, they're like, oh, yeah, Lee can do that. And, you know, I let other people say that stuff. I, I'm uncomfortable saying that stuff because I have a problem looking outside of the drum kit and playing. It's like, oh, that sounds okay. Oh, it sounds great. Uh, yeah, but inside you're dissecting it anyway. Oh yeah. And, and over analyzing the crap out of it. <laughs> um, and then I had gotten to know the crew over. They had me come out and watch two shows with Keo playing. And so the first show, uh, I think I watched from the side of the stage and watched Hank watch his mannerisms and a big thing with me was singer songwriters and whoever's front of the band, especially if they're playing guitar is what foot do they tap with? Do they tap with their heel? What watch their feet? Because that'll tell you where it's good. Especially somebody who's good at a competent musician that plays either great rhythm or pretty decent lead that that foot's going to be in time. It's not going to be jumping all over the place. That is the first time in 170 episodes that watching and analyzing the, it's essentially the ictus, like a conductor of a symphony, the, the baton. No one has mentioned watching the foot. That's exactly. Awesome. And you can watch um, like when Hank does Kalija and I have to have his fiddle up really loud to follow his tempo changes. But there's a couple people in the band that somehow they can watch his forearm and get it. You know, it's a little too jerky from my point of view to do that. But like Bart, our guitar player, he can watch his hand and see where it's going to go. Is there a set list? You know? uh, a lot more than there used to be. 
<laughs> so every night is like going into battle. It is some sort of a musical experience that will be completely different from the previous night. Uh, a lot of the stuff's the same. It's kind of like being on a football team and Hank calling the plays, which is a really weird analogy considering how long he's done the Monday night football theme. Yeah. But if he says a certain thing, we're going to do this. If he says this, we do have the first seven or eight songs. There is no click. I count off four songs the whole gig, and then he's got the rest. Amazing. I like that sometimes where it's like, hey, I really have no responsibility for starting the tempos. I just have to fall in perfectly with, with whoever this person starts. Yeah. It's very and liberating. The fact, well, that and also the fact that the person starting it, if it's not us, it's usually the person whose name is on the marquee. Heck yeah. And the fact that they trust us enough with that foundation of the song and to hold it together while they do all the other stuff on top of it is pretty cool that they trust us enough to go, all right, I don't have to worry about that behind me because it's going to be there. Yeah. So. So what a fun experience. So you get that gig in 2019, then the entire world changes in March of 2020. There's an international global pandemic and Fauci is just printing money. And then what happens? Do you guys stop for a year? Or what do you do? We stopped uh, March 16th. I think I went and did a, uh, in fact, I know I did. I went and did a, a video thing you know everybody was starting to do that from their homes yeah and i went and did one with vince moreno and gage baker and i'm trying to remember i want to say sean bailey might have been on fiddle we did it at vince's house yeah and he had um uh, you know his and his wife and a friend of his wife was watching from the living room while we were in the kitchen where he was shooting it for like the long haul look or whatever. Yep. And so just playing Cajon and stuff like that. And turns out like three days later, the friend that was watching in the other room had COVID and that was early on. Oh my God. <laughs> so it was like, Oh man. And then what a week later, Joe Diffie passes away. And uh, so it was that, right. You know, that made it even the more real scary. Oh gosh. Hey, you so, mentioned yeah. Gage Baker. Is that the gauge that's an incredibly tall bass player that played on lower Broadway? So Six when, foot eight. when I played uh, my days and uh, my eight months that I played lower Broadway in 1997, played a lot with that cat, man. He's fantastic. Is he still doing that down there? Uh, I don't know how much he's doing down there. But he uh, went on to play, get some artist jobs. Yeah. No, he didn't. I, I tried to pull him into the chestnut gig at one point when when there was a talk about making a change there yeah um and i think his thing i've came to find out knowing him for for that many years is you know by even our height and i i mean i'm six foot six foot one no oh, rub it in we're <laughs> but we're still touching the the top and the bottom of the bunk yeah he can't fit in a bunk so he'd have to sleep in the back or the front right so it, i don't know about that but even at six foot eight he feels like he'd be crushed in there yeah and he carved out him a nice little cottage industry playing in town and now he still goes out and does like road dates with vince moreno you know doing the doing some of the honky-tonk clubs across texas and new mexico nice. i would like but to Gage say hi is, to him again man he was he was literally in my paper rolodex and i have not seen it <laughs> a lot of technology has come and gone uh flip phones uh blackberries the first iphone oh, yeah. now we're on the iphone 14 or whatever the 15 whatever the hell it is haven't seen him since uh, so if you see him please say hello for me and i'd love to just yeah i'd love to just say hello that's crazy i will i'll send you his number i still have it awesome yeah he's great uh we spent four years together on monday nights in the front room of tootsies with ray st germain jr fronting it Gage on bass, John Scott on fiddle and keyboards, and me on drums. 
good for you that you did the Tootsie's front room. It's like, how much for that drummer in the window? Now, that's the, <laughs> that's the only room I haven't played down there. I've played the upstairs at Tootsie's, but never the front room. That, the last time I played Tootsie's was the front room, and that's the last time I played the front room. It's just Crazy. It's so claustrophobic the early the older you get. <laughs> yeah, man. And that place is just, uh, I don't know how they get away with it, but it's per perpetually a fire hazard. The yeah. amount of people that are in there, you know? Yeah, whenever I play down, I mean, I haven't played a regular gig down there in years, but I'll still sub if somebody calls that I know. It's like, oh, that'll be fun. Yeah. You know? And, of course, you do make a lot more money nowadays down there than we you used to. Hey, you remember uh, when we would park? We, it was free to park in Nashville. You'd go do a shift on Lower Broadway. You'd bring all your stuff, do your load in. You might leave with like eight dollars. Yep. Now you can <laughs> now you can leave with four hundred and eight dollars. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah, how crazy that boom has become since it's become the it city. Yeah. You know? But I always like playing the Sanderson's clubs a lot, like the Stage and Legends, Second Fiddle, and Crossroads, which is now Hank Jr.'s bar. So, oh, wow. <laughs> they redesigned the entire inside. It looks nothing like Crossroads did. So Wow, incredible. So so you're working for this Legend. So you guys take two, 20 and maybe start at 21 off? When do you go to back we to started, work? We started back our first gigs. We did two shows at billy bob's in texas on in april of 2021 uh everybody had to get vaccinated which was yeah. fine with me yeah uh it was you know it was part of not only hank but also vector management you know that's and right. which has uh i'm sorry yeah vector management ken levitan and that whole bunch which has a huge you know bunch Boston. of artists to yeah. watch out for and so we you know and Hanks only usually does about 20 to 25 shows a year. It's what we all call it's the best part-time job ever. Then you can go do whatever else. <laughs> so not to be nosy, big, but people, we talk yeah. about a lot on the show. Um, you get a check all year or you just pay handsomely for those 25 shows? Handsomely for the 25 shows. Look at you. Tonight, which got, which can also be great because then you don't feel like you're so locked in. There's a lot of freelancing going on which is great. No, there's not. And there's been a couple of times where like I haven't subbed out, but like Jimmy Hall being there for 30 some years and him being Jimmy Hall, you know, wet Willie and all that stuff. Yeah. Jimmy has carte blanche to go. If he has something he has to go do, like when I joined, he was still touring with Jeff Beck. So he, yeah. So, yeah, he'd have to deal with either me or Vinny Caluda. <laughs> Amazing, bro. See, you're in the well, mix in a well, major way. Well, the funniest thing he ever said to me, and I posted it on the Nashville Drummers thing once, was he walks up to me and goes, man, Lee, you and Vinny have something in common. I went, really, Jimmy? What's that? He goes, y'all both dress alike. <laughs> Dang. So he's a he's a, he's a Oh, jokester. that was great. He's a jokester. Oh, I, lo I love Jimmy. And he's just, you know, Salt what a great voice. He was actually the first band and act I saw the day that I moved to Nashville. Was that with Tommy Wells, the Prisoners of Love? It's, it sure was, and I met Tommy that night. God rest his soul. Oh, and stole the idea. You remember how all the metronomes had the mount for the cymbal stand then? Yep. But, yeah, and they break. Oh, yeah. Because you, you know, hit on them, and, you know, so the plastic would snap. Yeah. Yeah. I'm watching the prisoners of love and I'm watching Tommy's got his on a board. Yeah. I'm like, how'd she do? I walked up to him and met him. I knew him from modern singing, modern drummer, you know, that same old thing. Hey man, I just moved here. How you doing, man? Yeah. And, uh, I stole that idea from him. I was like, I am totally stealing Velcroing the metronome to the thing. I still do it to this day. If I hey, the, Vel it. the Velcro on a, on a wood plank is, is, is a fantastic thing. And I will say this about Tommy. He was also another incredible encourager. And I'm, I'm so happy that you, that was one of the first people you met as well. I ended up in 98 taking a like six week country, sorry, studio drumming class with Tommy and really? Jerry crew. Oh, Wow. And so they would talk about 
setting up clicks on the SR16. They would talk about mounting your metronome, reading the number system, tuning house kits, playing styles. It was cool, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you go learn, go to the go to the right place. Like go that. to the source. Yeah. Yeah. Like when I had to learn, when I got into country, like we all did in the mid '90s or early '90s, when drums became more prevalent, you know, with bands like you know Black Hawk and Little Texas and Mark the Mark Chestnuts and the Tracy Birds. Um, and the drums, the drums mean, kept know, getting louder and louder, and there was a piccolo yeah. snare drum in the mix. Thanks, Lonnie. Thanks, Eddie. <laughs> thanks, Brian Prout. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, uh, Paul Lime. Uh, yeah, you got everyone had a piccolo. Do you have a piccolo? I don't even have a piccolo in this room right now. I do now because Mark Niemer, uh, funny enough, last year Slim Yamaguchi from the Mark Chestnut band called and asked me to. They were changing drummers. Darla was going to come off the road, and he asked. He said, do you have some guys you could suggest? So I, Mark was one of the guys I suggested. Mark got the gig. And as a thank you, Mark gifted me a three by 14 piccolo. Look at that. That I have in the other room. <laughs> you know, I'm going to get one. I'm, 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 I'm going to beg DW for one just to have one. one. Probably one of the carbon ones. They've got the carbon fiber piccolos. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll probably, well, I probably... mean, the, the, the snap has to come back. They can't. The snares can't be tubby the whole time anymore. We've been wearing the tub factor out for about a decade now. I'm telling you, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather have it a little more wide open and honking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I heard somewhere that, you know, if you, if, if at all possible live, you like to tune your drums completely wide open with as little muffling as possible and let the front out house engineer have a complete Mona Lisa to work with creatively, you know? Absolutely. You know, a little bit of muffling in the kick drum, maybe a piece of duct tape on the snare, maybe yeah. a small gel. But I'll work with Billy, and he'll tell me, since I use two 16-inch floors, one on each side, I tune one of them higher than the other one. If it gets a little close where I can't hear that in the in-ears, you know how that'll give you a false sense of, yeah. of tuning? You know, he'll tell me, and then I'll pull the ears out and fix it. Yeah. But I'll work with him well enough that I don't have to deaden anything else. All the toms are wide open. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, dude. I was on a session exactly one year ago, and I brought in my wide open DW drums, 24, 13, 16, 18, and I had, they were wide open. And the engineer goes, I love how I don't, how brave you are. These are so wide open, man. I, I, you want to try to go for that today? I was like, yeah, sure. Let's go for the wide open drums. Isn't that what we want? And it turns out as soon as the client, showed up and as soon as we started going through running through the song she's like man we got to break out the tea towels man you know just so sorry <laughs> but, but it's, that's another current trend right you got to have the tea towels and you get the you get the little clips on the edge and you get to move them as far far in or just on the edge mm -hmm. it's crazy also like the 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 whole bandana that covers the whole head yeah can't remember what they're called but oh, i like yeah, those a lot root cqs that's it. Yeah. yeah. I like you, those and you got to have them because the root CQs and the big fat snare drums and the drum dots and the drum tacks and the moon gels and the, and Evan, the, the Evans rings and all of it. They've all got a different vibe. Uh, yeah, you, you just don't need the dead ringers. Remember those oh, that yeah. you would glue into the heads? Ah, uh, yuck. I yuck. remember seeing uh, seeing Merle Haggard and Biff had glued dead ringers into his drums. Oh, yeah. I want drums, but I don't really want to hear them that well. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think are the skill sets that got you the job with Hank and are, as are keeping you there? Oh, big ears. It's a unique gig, right? I mean, yeah, it's a very unique gig. He's an icon. And uh, I don't want to say potentially there's a reputation where he may not be easy to work with. I mean, I worked with Hank Williams, the third and oh, me too. He yeah. was not easy to work with. Well, yeah, we shared that gig. Uh, me, you, and Jim Riley, I believe. Did you do it when he was still doing his granddad stuff? Ninety nine. Okay, so he was yeah. still doing the old country stuff. Yep, and he did not want to rehearse. He wanted the sound nope. very loose. I was like, I couldn't wrap my head around it. I was like, wait a minute, you don't want to sound good? He goes, I want to sound good, but not tight. Yeah, jump, jump in when I start that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah. Which is fine because you know, pick one of three or four grooves. You're yeah. just going to change tempo, 
And, oh, so who did you play with? I mean, Jason Brown was on bass back then. Yes. For sure. Yeah. Who? And then there was a guitar player from, like, the Jesus Lizard. Oh, wow. Remember that yeah. that kind of, like, iconic rock band? Like, very underground. Uh, I um, sure do. I, re- I don't remember the cat's name, but if you, I'm sure everybody can get into the wiki. There was a band called the Jesus Lizard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, when I went and subbed for Jim on that gig... It was just for a weekend in Colorado somewhere. We played above the, you know, above the slot machines on the gaming floor. Amazing. Uh, first time I got on the bus and Shelton walked out, I did a double take because he looked so much like his granddad. Sure. It was just like, holy crap. Like seeing a ghost, really. But on that particular run, I had Red Card on guitar, Jason Brown on Doghouse, Vernon Derrick on fiddle, who was also part of the Bama band at one point, and Jim Murphy on steel, who had played with Johnny Paycheck for years. So all I had to do was sit back there and keep time and listen to these guys just quote great country music (laughs) and then go eat with them and sit there and not say a word and just listen to them tell stories the whole time. Amazing. Yeah, it was great. So, but Shelton was very honest. He's like, I'm doing this for Palamony. I'd rather be playing this. And he'd play me the, you know, the heavier stuff that he liked. Yeah. So, but yeah, fun stuff, you know, it's crazy. Palamony. The, yeah. Yeah. Like he had, he had recently done an interview with Rolling Stone back then. <clears throat> and when it, when the art, when the interview came out like three or four weeks later, after I'd played with him, it was essentially everything he told me. Because it was so fresh in his mind, he was still talking about yeah. what they had talked about. So he couldn't make any money with the heavier stuff like the Ash Jack stuff or what was the band he had with Phil Alsamo from Pantera. Yeah, I don't remember what, but it was heavy shit. Yeah. So he couldn't make any money doing that. It was so underground. So he could but he could go out and sing his granddad's stuff and make a lot of money. Yeah. And then pay for other stuff. You know, why he'd be sitting at home com- being competitive at video games for money <laughs> back then, <laughs> yeah. which was crazy. Yeah. But this, the skill set to play with Hank is like, just listen, know the stuff. Now, we'll kind of play most of the same songs every night, you know, and they're usually in the same spot at this point. You know, it's not as crazy as it was, you know, in years past. Uh, there is 10 or 11 songs he might do. And he's in six years with him. He's pulled three of them out. Ah. So, and you know, I've got those on a chart, but they all kind of start, you know, just grab hold. They'll avail themselves real quickly. And as long as you jump in before he's, we're full on, he's not going to care. <laughs> it's going to be fine. You know, we're all going to be there. And then, yeah, but, and then it's just, Making sure you're there on time when you're supposed to be there, being at bus call on time, being at the airport on time. Yeah. Uh, We had a few instances instances last year with a crew guy that, you know, was missing flights or bus call or whatever. You never want to be late. Never want to be late. So does he travel with you guys or is he uh, separate from the organization kind of a guy? He is a separate from the organization kind of guy. He actually flies in an hour before the show. Wow. Yep. And kind of takes over the, the band bus. And, you know, we kind of take our clothes and stuff into the dressing rooms anyway. Uh, and watch, you know, whoever else is on the, on the bill with us, you know, hang out with those guys or whatever, catering and all that stuff. You know, I'll see Hank if I have to go get a shirt off the bus. And exchange, you know, exchange a few pleasantries with him or something. Hey, cuz, how you doing? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and, uh, but most times I'll see him. First time I'll see him for the night is when he walks out or when he walks out and Billy, the front of house guy tells me to go. We're behind a curtain. I don't know if we will be this year, uh, but we're usually behind a curtain when we start. And then we, int- they intro him and it's saying we go. Yeah. So, and man, I'm so excited this year. We are on two shows together. I'm very, very excited. About that. Is this the Kid Rock stuff in the small towns? The seven shows that we're, we're doing in the We're on two of those with y'all. We, and is are you on our night or kids' night? 
Oh, what's are y'all not on the same what's one? What's crazy, we'll never see Kid Rock. He's always on the other night. Oh, I thought you guys were together. That would be oh, really smart. Were- I'd love to see that. But apparently, it's like we're on one night with a bunch of support, a rotating door of support, like 30 different bands that are going to be the support over the seven shows. So what I'm hoping is that you guys are on one of our de- one of those I shows. Know. Yeah. I didn't know that that's how it was working. I thought it was you guys were co-headlining it. And then the rotating acts were like us and everybody else. Well, I'd love to see that. you play the gig. I really, really would, man. That'd be so exciting. Oh, and I haven't, I haven't seen you play Jason's gig since North uh, Roswell, New Mexico, which was when about Hick- two thousand seven or two thousand six or seven. Hit Town was new. That would have been o- <laughs> that would have been oh five. Was- Yep, that was it. Hit Town was a single then. That's crazy. So I've been doing it nonstop touring since 2004. So we're, oh, it's 20 years of nonstop touring. Uh, that would have been the first year and a half. Yep. Who were you uh, with then? Very, were you that was Eric? Mark Chestnut. Wow. A lot has changed, buddy. We, we've gone through so many in our, uh, uh, incarnations of the band. So at that time, we were a ragtag group of like space pirates that would be hanging out at Moss Eisley, you know, and then we became, <laughs> we became like a motorcycle gang after that. And then we started, you know, paying attention to like, Hey, wait, maybe we're going to do skinny ties for two years. We'll be like the knack. And then we'll do the, <laughs> then we'll do the all black with the sports coat and the rock tee kind of thing. And now we're that we're, it is evolved, man. <laughs> kind of like when the Foo Fighters did the whole craft work look. Yes. <laughs> the red and the black and the red and the black. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, I know why you got the gig. That's incredible. But you mentioned two, two. I know why you got the gig and why you're holding on to the gig. Um, but you mentioned two things: listening and watching the toe. That's great. Mm-hmm. That's amazing, and that's probably something you've carried through. Now, I heard in another interview, it's also a similar technique you've used with Chris Knight. Now, <laughs> that, now Chris Knight's music is tried and true, like dirty uh, Americana music. You know, Mm -hmm. and um, and it's the same thing. You got to watch his hands. You got to watch his feet. Yeah, but like everybody else you watch, it lands all lands on the same plane. But he's he's flaming. He's yeah, he's somewhere in between there and it moves. So I spent about eight months on that gig and just it. I was afraid it was going to start to affect my playing. (laughs) Like in a bad way, uh, you start second guessing yourself playing with people who aren't second guessing themselves, but maybe they should be. <laughs> so I don't know, but it was a good experience. And I love, I still love Chris's music. He had written a couple things for Gary that we had played in Gary's band. So that was cool. And I mean, he's still out there doing it, doing the uh, thing. Gosh. Oh, yeah. He's not. I think Shaky Folks is out there playing with him. Shaky Folks, but I, I don't know yeah, that name. But also, but also through that, through the the Chris Knight gig is originally how the Kendall Marvel gig came up because the guitar player was the same. Yeah, Mike McAdam, who was part of Steve Earle's original, you know the the Exit O band way yes. way back then. So once again about relationships and. Okay, who's going to trust you? They got to know you. They got to like you. And they got to trust you. And you just got to rinse and repeat and hope for repeat business in this town. Now, you know, and I've been here 25 years. That's incredible to hear. Like, if I'm looking at some of these other names, Gary Allen gets you going. And then somewhere along the line, I mean, we're talking about all these shared gigs. Me, you, Jim Riley, all doing Hank the Third. Jim passes or puts in a good word or something you do that you're doing the Mark Chestnut thing. And then along the way, uh, some of these are subbing things. I don't know. Shannon Lawson, Trent Tomlinson. I was looking at some video of that Shannon Lawson, my claim to fame. I went to go see the Lord of the Rings with the guy in 1999. We sat next to each other and had popcorn. <laughs> he was a, he was a great singer. It, it didn't pop for him. You know, it doesn't Kelly Pickler. So, Heidi Newfield. So you got male artists, you got female artists, you got bands. The work you did with uh, subbing for Matt Fournette, there's videos floating around of the Loverboy drum cam. I think you're playing, you might be playing his kit, three up, two down. Immaculate, yep. immaculate work, man. So a lot, of, a lot of stories, a lot of cross pollination, <laughs> a lot of tentacles. How did the um, subbing for Matt Fournette come about? Well, I've known Mike Reno for a long time. Uh, 
I mentioned Ray St. Germain Jr. earlier. Well, Ray comes from a Canadian family, uh, well, the St. Germains, and his dad is a like a country icon up there, like had his own TV show in the 60s, kind of like Porter Wagner did. And Ray lived in or lives down here. He doesn't play music anymore or doesn't play out live. Well, actually, he does play out live. He and a, uh, another friend of ours still does a duo. But we did those four years at Tootsie's. Well, about 2002 or three, he goes, hey, I want to get a band together to back my brother-in-law. And I said, really, who's your brother-in-law? He goes, Mike Reno. And I went, really? <laughs> so we ended up doing a private gig with my engaged Baker played bass. There you go. Bo Cooper played key. Bo Cooper played keys. Um, Bo Cooper. Oh my God. Yeah. And, and out of that, Bo ended up subbing for Doug Johnson with lover boy for a while at one point. Yes. So within well, fast forward about 10 years later, and unrelated, uh, Jim McGathy, that used to work at Zildjian, yeah. got in touch with me and said, hey, I've got a friend of mine, a drummer friend of mine, who's thinking about moving his family to Nashville because their kids are in ballet. One's in Florida. One's in New York at the Met. I said, okay, who's that? He goes, Matt Fournette. I'm like, from Loverboy? Yeah. Matt and I became fast friends. Yeah. And for about, you know, we Talk every so often, about five or six years, and still do. Um, and he took some time off for about a month, and there was five gigs booked. And he said, go sit in my spot. And nice. I did the work and no rehearsal except for a sound check and charts and went and sat in his spot and had a, had a ball. I'd already knew, known Mike, uh, and I had – drum tech for Matt a time or two when his guy couldn't make it. Yeah. He's like, Hey, will you come fly out and take care of me? For sure, man. No problem. You know, nice. I mean, I grew, you know, growing up as a teenager, uh, I also hung out with crew guys and helped set up stages and swap that band sugar Creek. I like, I remember one time honeymoon suite came in from Canada when they were I got and, a new girl now. Yep. And the hit they had when they came through was feel it again. Yes. And so I'd go with sugar Creek who were the regional guys and you know, they'd open up for them and swap to say that. So I have no problem wrapping my hands around gear and stuff like that. Oh, you're you know? a smart man. You know, you're a smart man. And, the, and then the fact that you wouldn't be like too precious to be like, no, I'm a drummer, not a drum tech. Of course, of course, man, go out there make set it up, shine it up, make sure that everything's in tune. <laughs> You know, give the guy a bottle of water and a towel. Cha-ching. You travel. Yeah. You get to hang out with your buddies. You make some cash. And then exactly. you start you start this relationship. And you got to go crash, crash, crash. Crash, crash, crash. Yeah. 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 So and it was it was a lot of fun because they were the first video I ever saw on MTV. So Red it's leather. very sur Yeah, very surreal. And but they they're great. And yeah. to hear and it's still four of the five original members. No, that's very rare is, in a legacy rock band. And uh, the only reason it's not five is because Scott Smith passed away. Well, this is the, uh, seems to be the theme of the show today. Death and music. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then we're going to start talking about AI like you talked about. There'll be death to music. This is why everyone's <laughs> like, well, we don't listen to Redmond's podcast because he just gets <laughs> just old people on that talk about <laughs> death. Sorry, guys. No, this is just this is just what happens. We're um, we can't help it. We can't help that we're old. I'm 56 year olds today. So that, you, today's your birthday. Yep. Man, and you're still doing this interview, man. I would be somewhere with my face and a, a big a sugar pie, big cake. <laughs> no, I got my coffee right here. And oh, I'm me good. too, dude. Like happy birthday, brother. 56. Thank you very that's, much. That's awesome. So have you been getting your AARP literature to the house? It is. It is just. I was doing a casino gig with uh, Little Texas a year or two ago. Yeah. And we had some time. Either, either we did it for two days or we had some time. And so I went to the movie theater in the casino. And they said, would you like a senior discount? And I was like, I was like, wait a minute. How much? How old do you have to be with the senior discount? They said 55. And I was like, okay, this, I'll take it. This sucks. <laughs> so how deep was it? It wasn't very deep of a discount, was it? 
I was only a couple of bucks, but I was like, okay, sure. I just keep forgetting to ask now. <laughs> That's incredible. Oh my God, dude, that is nuts. Okay, so you're subbing. So you're subbing for Del Gray as well. I guy. did for I, I did for two and a half or three years almost. Uh, yeah. Dale was diagnosed. He had cancer. I did not know that. Wow. Yeah, he he kept it pretty quiet. Uh, they just said be? health issues. Is he doing okay? Oh, he's doing great. In fact, I was texting with him yesterday and today. Uh, talked to Dwayne Propes uh, a couple days ago, bass uh -huh. player. Yeah. Um, he's doing great. Uh, he has beat it, it looks like. He started coming back out, riding the bus a couple times while I played. And then he took back over in December. They did a couple rehearsals, and he's all good. He's back at it. Yeah, man. Yeah. You got to play that God bless Texas just like me because I was in that band Rush Low, so we had a little. Oh yeah, we had a little Texas medley in there. We had to do, you know. I'm sure great songs, man. Heck yeah, great, great songs. songs stand the test of time. <laughs> and we did a show with um, the front men oh, with Hank. The front men opened, so it was Larry and uh, oh uh, Richie and and Tim. Was Pat uh, Pat Matt Krause playing drums? No, he wasn't. Matt had moved on. And I cannot remember who's playing. That's I've, right. I've met the guy. Link was playing guitar, but yeah, Matt had. They had just changed drummers, and Matt had just come off the road. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> now, how long were you with Chestnut, man? That's a nice song, Cat. That, that's a nice uh, body of work that he has. It is. I was with Mark for five years, from two thousand three until two thousand eight. Nice. Started, you know. They had the package tour going on. I think it was him, Joe Diffie, and Tracy yeah. Lawrence. Uh, Joe and Mark tried to get me on that, but it was Tracy's turn to pick the drummer. So I went out and, and tried it, and I wasn't really Tracy's bag, even though I wouldn't have. You know how you can fit some gigs and you won't fit other ones? Sure. It happens to everybody. You know? Yeah. And if it doesn't happen, it's going to happen. Yes. Um, and so I wasn't really a fit for Tracy as much as I would have been a great fit and was a great fit for Mark and a good, I was good fit for Joe if that would have come up, which it did. And I kind of, since I'd known Mark longer and he kind of brought me to the party, I s stayed with Mark out of that, that three, three front men and one band thing breaking up. And, and, and Mark is a uh, drum hobbyist. He plays some drums, doesn't he? Like oh, well, drums. he that's he grew up playing drums before he switched to fronting when Crazy. he grew up in Texas. And so he can keep a beat for yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, every once in a while, he'd throw me off the kit to play, but it would drive him nuts because our height difference is so different. And also for me being tall, I sit really low. And so he was like, I'm playing like this. He's, he's, you sit <laughs> like too a damn praying low. mantis yeah yeah but there was a couple times he's like move man i want to play I'm like, okay go ahead at one time when in the early days we had a double bill with him and he came up on the bus and aldine didn't have his cowboy hat on and he looks like a completely different human being without his cowboy cat right because that's like his caricature that's his look and um mark kept saying now guys when you see al dean you tell him such and such and for me he was telling al dean this and now when <laughs> when you see jason tell him i love that song and then and then we were just like do we tell him right now that he's talking to jason oh it's, gosh it's hilarious <laughs> oh yeah. yeah mark's awesome but uh, he's another one glad he trusted me with his music and yeah you know. It was with a bunch of guys that I had made friends with because we'd already been on the road when I was playing with Gary. So yeah, all the guys that Jim had played with when Jim had moved on to Rascal Flats. So there's this theme here, like between me, you, um, Jim, Keo, uh, just sharing gigs, man, passing things what? back and forth to each other, you know? A lot of incest going on there. There's some some incest. <laughs> now, 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 if only if you want to, I am out of the loop. Today's your birthday. Happy, happy, happy birthday. Thank um, you. <laughs> your personal life. Did you have kids? Did you were you married? Are you married? What happened? I never see you. <laughs> Where do oh. you live? What what borough are you in? <laughs> I'm out in Lebanon. I'm about oh, okay. a mile. Yeah, I'm 
on the west side of Lebanon on a hill where I can see completely across town to 12 miles across town to the east side of Lebanon. That's so great. I can see the city lights and all that stuff. That's great. Uh, oh, it's fantastic. Um, I was married for a little while. Well, actually, I was with Danae, my wife Danae, for now ex-wife, for about 15 years. Oh, that's a good run. And, man. Oh, yeah. That's and, two seven-year itches. <laughs> yeah. I do, but, you know, COVID had a lot to do with it. You know, us being, you know. On top of each other. Same, yeah. Yeah. In the same space for a while. And um, and we also have a son. We have a son named Dylan. Who, oh, uh, great. Yeah. He, turns, he? he will turn 14 in April. Dang. And he and I FaceTime and text every day. Uh, they live down in Helotus, Texas, which is close to where she's from. And she has a little more of a support system with family there. My ex-in-laws still live here in Gallatin. Ah. And in a couple of weeks, they'll come up for his spring break and he'll hang out here a good bit. And he's with me through the summers. Um, does he play an instrument? What's his thing? He does. He does not. In fact, not sadly, but he did come up to me when he was uh, smaller, and he goes, "Dad, can I?" He's very sensitive. He's very sweet. So we have raised him right, and my ex-wife and I are very amicable. So that's all good. Great. Uh, oh yeah, that you know, we still text and talk. Hey, when are you coming up? What's going on? Blah blah blah. Uh, and he comes to me and goes, "Dad, can I tell you something without hurting your feelings?" I said, "Sure, man. Anything." He goes. Music's really not my thing. And I'm like, that's fine. It wasn't any of my family's thing either, except for me. We are the black so, sheep, my friend. Yes. Well, yeah, for sure. You know, tattoos and all that stuff too. Uh, but his thing is more art and video games. Um, and uh, right now, instead of action figures, they now get posable figures. You know, that are, you know, it's like the action figures we were have, but they have a lot more posable ways and stands ah, and stuff. Gotcha. So they take pictures of them and pose them and, you know, send pictures to their friends and stuff. Interesting. But, so he might go to he, an art school or something like graphic design or. Exactly. And I, he plays video games a lot, which is, we were kind of in the gray area of video games where now it's, I mean, even I play a few things on Xbox and I'm blown away by the graphics. It's and so immersive. I had to get rid of my Xbox because I went through a period of 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 the Duke, <laughs> the Duke Nukem's and the Dooms and the Resident Evils and is like I like first person shooters. But next thing next thing you know, you're like you've been on the couch for seven hours, your butt sweating, and you ate a giant bag of M and M's, and you're like, I did nothing with my life for seven hours. You know? Yeah, I I can't sit that long, but I can get a couple hours into like Red Dead Redemption or Cyberpunk or something like that. I like the the role playing. Yeah. Uh, storyline stuff oh yeah yeah but i keep explaining to dylan i'm like you know the people that make these games make a lot of money that's right and it's through art that was the one thing about the pandemic that really bothered me is the way that not only musicians but artists as a whole are treated yeah because everything that you touch everything that you use on a day-to-day -day basis at one point is touched by an artist yeah. that had to mock it up, draw it up, come up with how it looks, come up with how it works. Uh, so, you know, and I'm sure we all have the big wince, like before we were actually making a living at this and you get the question at family get togethers of, so how's that music hobby going, you know, or stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, Hopefully it's getting better. It's I am really pleased to see that once the floodgates open back up, that live music is extremely alive and well. It is no matter what market you're playing in, whether it be arenas, sheds, uh, the smaller outdoor theater, outdoor venues that have popped up. Yeah, the even smaller ones that are in uh, like community areas. Yeah, and then and then all the I'm doing some uh, sub dates this year with the uh, 
the Tribute Act 20 and Lynn, which is the grandchildren of Conway and Loretta. Oh, nice. And and something tells me they're going to play every small, even small town has that downtown square where there's a historic, probably haunted theater that sits between 500 and 2,000 people. Exactly. Yeah. And that's exactly the ones they play. Uh, Little Texas have been playing some of those. Yeah. And it's really cool to see some of those smaller theaters get new love. Because a lot of them are now being repurposed, and the downtown areas of these smaller towns are coming back up. And it's fun. You support the economy. You know, the bus pulls in front of the theater. You could go next door, support the local coffee house, buy a T-shirt from them. You go to Soundcheck. After the show, there's a hang at the Martini Bar across the street. Exactly. It's cool. And it's a blast. Yeah. And it's it's a lot of fun. So, But it's really cool to see all the different levels of live music what looks to be coming back stronger, of course, it is the main revenue stream for our industry now, pretty much. So I'm pretty hopeful for things in the future, and I'll be with Hank until he's done. <laughs> yeah, you know what? One, yeah, something is once you find something, I, I, I tell all the kids that, uh, you know, I did a, a lesson slash consultation yesterday these guys will come into town like hey can i book an hour of your time over at the drum pad at drum paradise and we do some playing but usually a lot of talking they ask questions and and i'm like you know the one thing that you really need to try to happen is to try to get a steady job in the music business something where you have a w-2 where you can buy a home where you you know just have that home base do all the freelancing you want work at as many fun side projects do as many music row sessions home sessions as you want keep the calendar full but have that home base where you can your home base is you can count on 25 well-paid gigs per year with that one act and you could sprinkle everything across the calendar which is amazing Mm -hmm. and it gives me a lot of freedom as i get older yeah you know i've i've had a job of some kind since i was 12 years old what was the day job when you moved to Nashville? Like I parked cars, waited tables, and was a substitute teacher. What did you do? I worked in the warehouse at Pearl Drums. Very practical job because you're meeting other drummers. Well, it was a heck, you know, you know Rick Murray, our yeah. buddy. Yeah. Okay. Well, Rick was a big influence on me playing country and coming to Nashville. Yeah. Um I worked for Rick at his drum shop called Drums and Company in Charlotte. And, of course, would go out and watch him play at Coyote Joe's when he was the house drummer. Uh, but, oh, and where was I going Joe's. with this? I completely Coyote lost my Joe's, train of thought. Buddy. Coyote Joe's. I mean, that's a <laughs> rite of passage, man. We used to play there with Eldeen. And and I, instead of instead of us being the headliner with that mentality, like, hey, you're the opening act. You should play on my drums. I ended up playing on the, the house guy's uh, drums a lot. Did you really? <laughs> I played on his drums. They're all falling apart, and I'd have to duct take the the legs of the hi hat to the stage and everything. It's like, oh boy. And that would be after Rick because I know Rick's drum kit was fabulous when he played there because I played on it a few times. Yeah. Uh, but because of Rick and working at his drum shop, we knew people in the Pearl, you know, in Pearl. So when I moved. We, you know, we worked it out for me to get a job in the warehouse and work part time. So if I picked up a gig, I could call and go, hey, I'm not coming in. Or if I had a late night from hanging out trying to get gigs, I could call in and go, hey, I'm not going to be in, you know, or if I went out on the road with somebody, I could come back and the gig would still be there. Nice, flexible you know? job. Yeah. Yeah, it was flexible. I mean, there was no benefits because I was part time. Mm-hmm. But if I'd gone full time, I couldn't have left and gone and played gigs and stuff. So that's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, yeah, you know. So and then the you know the best thing that ever happened was uh, not having to work those day jobs anymore. But I substitute Todd. It was like you know with my master's degree back in nineteen ninety nine two thousand. It was. Um, 75 bucks a day, man. You know, mm-hmm. the thing is, is that we played in the club till 2.30 in the morning. And by the time we got home and decompressed, it was 3.30 in the morning. And I was supposed to be standing in front of that classroom at <laughs> 7 in the morning. And that was rough. Oh, uh, at least I could, you know, wander in at 9 at Pearl and yeah. function well enough to fill out orders. 
you know it's so funny uh, you're uh you if you go to your website it's a beautiful website very robust it's got a lot of information on you lee kelly on drums and ladies and gentlemen it's k-e-l-l-e-y lee kelly on drums.com taking a look around every drummer's got this interesting little thing that nags at them throughout their lifetime and and it seems that for you it was voiceover and on my website i have a voiceover demo i heard your voiceover demo when did you start experimenting with that he sounds great man well i haven't messed with it in years i just tried a course with joe lesh joe lesh oh. lives six houses from me oh so you still live over there i didn't I, know you were still over there yeah i'm here but yeah i've been here 14 years crazy okay yeah you're because I, I remember passing your house going to his yeah yeah you know? um i tried it um just out of curiosity there you go really yeah. um also my dad was in broadcasting my oh. dad was in in nascar broadcasting for universal racing network Ah. in the 60s and 70s and my older brother winston he was on mrn radio motor racing network for 33 years from 1988 until 2021 is when he stopped being a regular pit reporter for mrn radio yeah and he just does his day job which is run the nascar hall of fame oh that's um, cool oh it's yeah, my my family goes back, or my dad goes back to NASCAR predating the sanctioning. Like my dad, my dad came out of World War II as a a, a gearhead a little bit, um, which and it kind of wrote my grandfather. I haven't gone to ancestry dot com and done this, but my grandfather was a moonshiner. Wow. Yeah, my grandfather was a moonshiner. Ba bathtub uh, moonshine. Well, I don't know if he made it or if he just ran it, but the story I've heard is he died running it. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it wasn't a great household, so I don't guess it was a great household to grow up in. Yeah. Uh, so my dad and his two brothers after Pearl Harbor, and they were old enough, which at that time was 17, they all three went into the service. Yeah. My dad went into the Navy. My uncle went into the Marines. My other uncle went into the Army. So when they came back, dad tried. He actually tried racing, did five races, and said that was enough. You know, that's enough. You know, that could get me killed. Yeah, I can't handle that kind of speed. No way. Oh, it's, it's insane. I've, I've been a passenger in one of those cars to go around at, you know, 170 miles an hour. You have been? Are you crazy? Yeah, I've ridden in, yeah, they, uh, like at the tracks that have uh, cars that you can, that you go take driving classes at, that kind of thing. They have passenger seats in the, in the cars, even though it's got full roll, roll cages and just like a stock car. So with too much Sylvia, we played Charlotte Motor Speedway in 2000, I'm sorry, in 1994 when the final four was there. Yeah. And we played Charlotte Motor Speedway. They were taking people around in the cars, and we, just, me and I, jumped in one, and my buddy jumped in the other. When you could feel the G forces jerk your head back. Wow! And I'd already been around it through my dad and stuff for years, and already knew they were athletes. You know, being from Carolina, that's kind of our sport. Yes. Uh, so, so my dad ended up in broadcasting at one point. My my brother did it, and we've got this voice. You know, that if you get rid of the Southern accent, it comes out a little more robust and sounds like well, my brother. When I met you, <laughs> I, when I met you, you know, I mean, I spent a lot of time in Texas, but the Texas Southern accent is different from the Carolina Southern accent. I had never heard an accent so thick. When I met you, <laughs> I was like, wow, this guy is yeah. getting six syllables out of one word. Yeah, we'll do that. And. Even my family says it got a little thicker when I moved to Nashville. I think so. So wow, it is what it is, you know. Yeah. So you did. <laughs> so you did your demo with Joe Lesh. I did. Nice. And then I tried pursuing the pay-to-play sites or whatever. Voices one, two, three, and all that. Yeah. Yeah, just kind of. Eh, if something came up, great, you know. Yeah. 
If, the fo- the folks not- that do it full time, Lee, are that I know some people that have had some success with with those pay to play sites, and they literally they get up super early so they could be yep. on West Coast time, and they answer the. Uh, they respond to all the ads immediately, and then they literally are in front of their computer all day. And if the job comes in, they, there's a deadline. They got to knock it out. They are tied to their home studio all day. Yeah, all day. Yeah, and I like to have a life. So <laughs> yeah, so you're in Lebanon. I was just um, I was the MC for the Bach to Rock Awards at the Capitol Theater two oh, cool. Saturdays ago. Two Saturdays ago. Nice. Yeah. So also, there's something you were a big influence to me, just so you know. Ah. I remember coming out of shoulder surgery in 2016. Yeah. And you were doing your weekends. Drummer weekends. Feet, yeah. You were doing your drummer weekends. And I had never, I remember texting you going, I'd never seen your spiel. Let me, I, can I come by? And you were gracious enough. Hey, come on, drop in. And I, one, I'll never forget when I walked in, you stopped whatever you were saying, introduced me and told about the, the class of 97, which I thought was fantastic. Our history. Then yeah. I meet Troy Laquetta, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, hero of mine, you know, Tesla yeah. and all that stuff. And just your enthusiasm, which has always been like just all over you. Your enthusiasm is infectious. Oh, I'll take it as a big compliment. Thank you. Oh, please do. Yeah. And but you talking about being the positive guy in the room. That was a I mean I've never thought about it. You know, just kind of been me and things have worked out. But that sticks in the back of my mind all the time. Wow. Like it really does. It's like, yeah, just don't don't be the downer. Don't you be know, the Debbie sure. Downer. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, man. You want to have a good time. Well, you so. always I've never seen you have a bad day. Like you are like a high energy person. Like, so if you get me and you in a place for one or two hours, it's gonna be like a uh, earthquake, you know? Yeah. You've got a lot, of the sun. <laughs> a lot of energy, man. A lot of energy. Is your son like that? Uh a good bit. Yeah. Uh uh. Like, I mean, he really, it's funny how when we were growing up, everybody went outside and played and, yeah. you know, you're not in until you hear the dinner bell ring two, three blocks away. And now they're on their games on their PS five and they're still playing with people. They're on, you know, they're online, but it's changed. I mean, I COVID showed that anyway, but that was because they had to, but I think, that's how it, it that's how it is now. Yeah. I did ask him if he wants to do anything special. He likes to shoot basketball, so we'll go down here to uh uh Floyd the oh the whatever the basketball courts here are <laughs> and he'll play for a couple hours every day. So that's killer, man. That's killer. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, so yet I get the family thing happening. You got you're in your uh uh, boom, boom, drum room, and pe- <laughs> people are sending you the files, and you're knocking them out for people. You have fun doing that. Is it pretty consistent? Uh, it's not real. I haven't pushed it real hard. This version of it, like yeah. the one I had, Mount Juliet, you know, where I was in the bonus room, I promoted it a little more. Yeah. Uh, and funny enough, Pat and I would talk about, we'd look at you and Jim and go, man. They are just getting there all over the place. And Pat and I finally realized we're just lazy. <laughs> y'all are, y'all have a lot more motivation where Pat and I are just like, Oh, let's go to the beach. Right. You know? Um, and so, and also COVID except for playing gigs and doing what I had to do kind of took the wind out of my sails. So, I'm honestly really just getting back to really wanting to do this here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, going you're, you're, gig, so you're saying that COVID had a, 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 a negative impact on your mental health. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. I'm glad I'm not the only one. I had to fight it every day with everything I had. Oh, uh, cause I miss uh, people. I miss people, you know? Yeah. It was, it was having, and I, it wasn't just, you know, drummers or anything like that. Like I talked to bandmates that I've played with forever. They're like, yeah, I just don't feel like doing it, man. Cause it was the first time in our lifetime that the rug was pulled out from under us. Yeah. So, and you couple that with 
even though it was an amicable, amicable divorce, you couple it with that as well. So that was 2000, uh, one, 2001 to 2002. Gotcha. Kind of got finalized last year, but that was just legalities. And stuff. Oh, you mean 2020 to 2021? Yeah, 2021, 2022. Sorry. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, um, and that was just legalities and stuff like that. But it's still, you know, if you, going and doing stuff that's booked is easy. Like, okay, I, I have that goal there. You know, I could walk in here, look at the kit, and just go, eh, I don't feel like it. Yeah. Uh, I don't have to. I don't feel like it. But now I kind of feel like it a lot more. Good. I had a friend of mine come over and help get my, uh, my, uh, my channeling, uh, or my routing correct. Sure. So I could have control over, uh, logic where I needed it. Signal path. Oh, for sure, man. And at that point I just play drums a lot of times. That's and great. It looks those, great. It looks like you got high ceilings there, like nine to 11 feet or something. It's great. It's one of the reasons I wanted to make sure I kept the house in the divorce was this room and also just the views and got an, an in-ground pool outside. Oh, nice. So keep, yeah. So kept that, make sure to keep that for Dylan when he's here during the summers. So you got um, this beautiful uh, house on the hill overlooking the city lights mm -hmm. that you can have all your new girlfriends out to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whenever I feel like dating. Yeah. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm feeling like doing it. I'm so I'm, been in here messing around with camera angles and stuff. And since my education, unlike yours and Jim's, like my, going back to my parents, not seeing it as a viable vocation. Sure. Um, and also I didn't want to do like a drum camp during the summer when I was in high school, because we had a place in North Myrtle beach in Cherry Grove, South Carolina that we would go and spend three months at. I'm like, Beach or a parking lot with drums. Yeah. Beach is gonna win. Yeah. Let's see a beach beach where I'm working at an arcade on the beach. I'm I, I'm there. I can appreciate a beach more than anyone because I worked so hard in the early years of my life that at least once a year I gotta you know what I discovered? It's only six hours away is uh not Myrtle Beach, but um Alabama? Orange Beach. Orange Beach, yeah. The beaches are nice. Beach. Yeah. Mexico Beach is Kendall Marvel's got a place in his family has a place in Mexico beach. That's gorgeous. Wow. Yeah. I just, and that's a gorgeous you know place. So, and North Myrtle beach is about 10 hours away. So yeah, yeah. this, the six but, hours yeah, from orange that. beaches, it's a little secret. It's like, Oh my God. I, cause every time I want to take a vacation, I'm thinking, well, I got to fly to LA. Then I got to get it. Then I got to go over water. I got to get to Hawaii. It's so expensive. You need, you need the, those two extra travel days, you know, six hours to orange beach. The beaches are nice. It's affordable. There's tons of great restaurants. I like it. Right. And also I, uh, my brother has a place over in blowing rock, South Carolina, mm -hmm. which is Boone and blowing rock. Uh, and occasionally, you know, I'll take off for there, but I, um, it wasn't a vocation. So my education back to that, my education stopped in high school. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So what I did before the pandemic hit and the wind was taking out of our cells, I had bought Todd Sukerman's rock drumming masterclass off of Drumeo. Cool. And so what I'm planning to do is record the play alongs that he has in there. Uh, and along the way, it's going to do kind of like an old dog learning new tricks thing for me. Yes. You know, even though I have enough vocation and enough tools in my shed to do the gigs I'm doing, I want to have a few more tools in my shed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it'll be fun for me to do it. And now I want to and get in here and put headphones on and play the stuff and and I don't get red light fever or any of that stuff. It's like, turn it on. Let's go. Yeah. To me, I'm just playing with another band. <laughs> yeah. So, oh man, that's, that's, that's really, really exciting. And, you know, speaking of which, who are some of your, uh, Mount Rushmore drummers coming up that you, uh, you're at Percaro. Yeah. I could be. Oh, absolutely. I can hear that absolutely. big time because there's, <laughs> there's definitely a focus on a, like there's a serious intention and, um, 
uh, focus on groove and pocket with you, man. And that's why you get gigs and keep gigs, you know? And you too. It's it, We're playing songs. We're, we're song drummers. And if we didn't start out as song drummers, Nashville made us song drummers. It gave oh, us a sure. PhD in song drumming. Yeah. And luckily, I grew up loving songs. So, like, my earliest drumming influence were, influences were Ron Bushy from Iron Butterfly, Lee Kerslake from Uriah Heap. Nice. 10 years before Ozzy, uh, Neil Smith with a, with Alice Cooper, uh, whoever was playing drums with parliament on chocolate city, mothership connection, clones of Dr. Funkenstein, strong ones. Oh, dude. Bam, bam, bop, bop, bop. Oh yeah. Clown yeah. in the one baby. Clown yeah. in the one big, uh, Freddie white from earth, wind and fire. Nice. Um, uh, later on, the ne- uh, the needle drop moment for David Garibaldi hearing Ebony Jam for the first time. Killer. And the In the Slot record. Um, later on, uh, somebody brought back Waiting for Columbus to our Camelot music I was working at as a teenager. And one of the guys went, you'll like this. The minute I heard uh, oh, oh, Fat Man in the Bathtub, I was hooked. Richie, Richie's big. Yeah. Jim Keltner. Uh Jim Gordon. Jim Gordon. Uh, oh gosh. Uh, Jim Jim Gordon's got a book out now, I believe. There's it's a- coming out. Yeah, I saw yeah. that on John DeChristopher's site. Yep. Oh, uh Floyd Sneed from Three Dog Night. Oh I yeah. Mean, come on. Um and then obviously Alex Van Halen. James Bradley Jr. from the Chuck Mangione. Live band. at the Hollywood Bowl. Man, that is still a life changing record for me. Now, I still listen to that. Yeah, we're, and we're love it so we're, much. We're pals on Facebook. Um, not super tight, but I remember, you know, and you would hear you would hear that that um flugelhorn, Chuck Mangione in uh in supermarkets and elevators yeah. every day. And then he went on to be that one hit wonder band called Crazy Town. Come, come, my lady. Yep. Come, come, my lady. That thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember when he popped back up and I was, is that, is that the same guy? Same guy. And it was, you know. Yeah. And the, I mean, the main squeeze album, which was Gad. That was great stuff. And then everything my brothers listened to, because they were 10 and 11 years older than me, Doobie Brothers, uh, Blood Rock. Uh, and then I would find stuff and go backwards. Like when little feet hit me, I was like, okay, when, when did that change from it being the first two or three albums to Dixie chicken? You know, there was a change in band members and a complete seismic shift from being a country rock band to being a like almost a New Orleans based second line band. Yeah. Which led me to, okay, here's the meters. Oh, well, I was already hit to Sick the Neville baby. Brothers. Yeah. Oh, Willie Green and those guys. I was already hip to that stuff. And so going back, and that's how I learned country too. So when we moved here, when you and I moved here and we were listening to Eddie and Lonnie and Jerry Croon and all those guys. I went backwards to learn the old country stuff. Like I would go to Skulls when Skull was still alive and watch Johnny Barber yeah. play. And so then I'd learn. And then Gary Allen was like, how much Buck Owens do you know? And I'm like, well, he haul stuff. And he goes, nah, go listen to Buck's stuff. Yeah. And of course, Willie Cantu becomes a huge influence. Yeah, that's oh, cool. You, you went to the source, man. You're like, I'm going down to Skulls, man. I'm going to live it and experience it. I went down to The Great Escape and bought everybody's greatest hits on cassette. So there Tammy Wynette's greatest hits and Buck Owens' <laughs> greatest hits. And and I was like, because I just knew that you have to learn the rules so you can break them. <laughs> right. right. You can't just Don't break where it them. comes from. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to play the Grand Ole Opry, and sit on Eddie's drums, and that person is going to be singing in that spot right there where Patsy and everyone sang. You better know the rules. <laughs> For sure, man. Is it a cross stick? Is it a stick and a brush? When do you go to the snare? What fills are appropriate? Um, 
do they use the ride symbol and cut like that early stuff? You got to know the rules. Yep. Yeah, man. And pretty interesting study. You know, it is. It's not, it's not as easy to play old country as it looks or sounds. Yeah. Now, yeah, my favorite old. room to this day, I don't know if you tell me, people probably hit you up all the time, man. They're like, hey, you know, this Nashville's the it city. I want to come and experience, do the thing. I say, man, go to Robert's Western World. It's my favorite place because you're going to hear those rockabilly bands and there's going to be those country, yep. the Brazil billies with their pearl snap shirts and the upright bass and they're just doing it right, man. Yep. I mean, that's one room that's still keeping the older stuff alive. Yep. Uh, there, AJ's across the street, I guess. Mm. Uh, and I just did a gig a few weeks ago at Music City Bar and Grill out of Music Valley. Yeah. And that was with Jeff Garris on guitar, J.D. Myers fronting it, and Robbie Turner on bass. Wow. Which, which if you if you... If you ever get a chance to play drums with Robbie Turner playing bass, I know he's known as the, the steel player legend that he is, but playing drums with him playing bass is a treat. Nice. And I mean, I knew he's a great musician, but I never knew him as a bass player. Yeah. And, but wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool. The man, man does it all. So. And what are you you doing anything special as we're aging with your um uh nutrition and fitness? Anything? Uh not really. Good for you, <laughs> Which, man. Probably probably sadly. I, I have I'm trying to cut alcohol out, honestly. Nice. Uh because it's kind of time. It's you know, I'm having some success with it. It's just but it's you know, as we get older, you don't recover as easily. And it's just better in the long run. You get more stuff done. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. And better for me. Um, now, now, when you're doing doing the alcohol, are, um, uh, do you discriminate or are you, are you like a uh, when in Rome guy? Oh, I'm at a wine bar. It's wine. I'm at a. Oh, no. Uh, I'm, I'm mainly just a whiskey guy. That's it. Oh, that's nice. Well, that's really sophisticated, especially if you <laughs> couple it with like a cigar or something like that. You know? <laughs> oh, I can't do the cigars, man. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. But, yeah. But. Um, Fortunately, drumming is enough of an uh, of enough exercise yeah. that I'm you know I'm not 300 pounds or anything like that. Uh, I do get out, try to. It's a mile around my block, so I'll try to get out and walk that. If it's nice out, like I got out and did it uh, this morning, nice before the rain started. Yeah, so just try to get out, get in nature a little bit. I always try to go out and walk around. Yeah, you know, After they're, they're almost they're, every sound check. Sure. Everyone's like throwing this term grounding around where you got to take your shoes off. You got your bare feet and you got to put your feet on the earth in some grass. And apparently there's some sort of a physiological metaphysical transformation that happens when you do this on a regular basis. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, cool. You know, because I try to check all the boxes, um, you know, hydration, supplementation, flexibility mobility um you know muscle tone heart health like i i work at it like a freaking job so like sometimes if i do it <laughs> if i got a choice between sitting down on a practice pad and i know how to do paradise right we've got the muscle memory but if i want to still play rock and roll drums the way i play i gotta make sure that i fucking go work out you know what right I mean? so, uh, <laughs> so that's why i just kind of ask because you know we're we're now uh men of a certain age hey listen um i can't i can't, can't kind of get behind the the feet in the grass thing yeah o only because the feet on the beach thing has always gotten me since i was a kid yeah and it still does um so that's I can get that. I yeah. can get behind that big time. <laughs> so so my version of experimenting with voiceover was, you know, going out to Los Angeles and studying acting. And I figured like, well, I can go out to a strip mall in Smyrna and take an acting class with a bunch of kids. Or I can go to Hollywood where everyone is a waiter and people actually want to get on Grey's Anatomy and I'm probably going to get a much better. So I, you know me, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it 150%. So I go out there and I do that grind for six years. If if I had a day where I was just, I needed a break, I'd drive my ass to Malibu, park the car along the Pacific Coast Highway and get my foot in the sand. And then the sun would set and there'd be this beautiful, the waves are crashing, your feet are in the sand, 
cotton candy sunset. You're looking at the topography there of Malibu and all those stars and their glass and adobe homes. And then you, the city lights come up and it was just like so relaxing and cool. Yep. You know, <laughs> and then you would go back to the grind the next day. Yeah. You know, a little less, less for wear. You know, yeah, a little bit less of aware. So, listen, I like to end. The, we didn't talk about Pat McDonald, um, but oh, I, that guy, he was kind of in it. He was in our graduating class and he right away. We're like, God, who's the weckle that just who's the bald weckle? You know, he was so precise. Everyone, oh. Every time I would describe Pat's playing, I was like, let's wait for this guy to come up and play. He is a surgeon. He is surgical. Yep. It, yeah, I remember the first time he sat in at 16th Avenue. I don't know if you were in the room or not, or Jim was, but I remember the room stopped. Yeah, like, I'm, sh- I'm sure I was there. Sh- yeah. Holy shit. Well, you know, and he's like blowing over a vamp or something, I believe. You know. Oh, yeah, they gave him a chorus, which, yeah. you know, it, I would get lost because I, you know, and you guys can count in your heads that stuff. Yeah, the but, form. Oh, yeah. And it just, Lord me, he was yeah. the perfect drummer for Charlie. He was. I yeah. mean, honestly, if you're gonna get a guy to play for Charlie Daniels, that's the guy. Yeah. You know. And then Ron and, Ganaway came after him. He did a great job too. Yeah. Oh, Ron's awesome. I like Ron. Ron's yeah. awesome. I haven't seen Ron in forever. He was another <laughs> hey, I'm sure same as you, but he was that just very another supportive guy who was like, Yeah, welcome to town, kid. Da da da. Good luck. Here's my number, you know. And I'd already known who he was from seeing him on TV with Steve Warner. Right. Like, oh, that's that guy, you know. And, you know, he had already made his bones by the time we already we were here. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, hey, so usually we'll end this thing with the uh, favorite five, and I'll ask you five of your favorite things. Your favorite color. Favorite color, blue. Okay. Then I'd be getting, I'd be getting some, some blue and greens, man. Do you ever have blue Even drum set? Even though I do not have a blue drum set, I I did have a, a blue marble AOT kit that Ray made me in the nineties. That was black and blue marble. They had the red marble was in the ads, and I ordered the blue marble sight unseen. I still had the snare drum, but I traded that kit for my Yamaha Absolute Hybrid Maples, and that's when I went to like black and dark drum sets like you. Yeah. They go with everything. It's like wearing a tuxedo on stage. It's classy. never going to get old. Classy. <laughs> so that, and I've got the classic walnut for the recording customs back here. Beautiful, man. I'm staring at a, <laughs> I'm, I'm staring at a set of cherry red long turret Dave Weckl era recording custom drums. Right. Oh, now. yeah. Ooh. They're not set up, but they're they're stacked up. And so if somebody wants that sound, you know. I could drag it over and mic it up, but everybody's got to have one of those drum sets, you know? And the good news is they will keep their value. <laughs> they do. They really, they really, really do. do, man. So that's your favorite Especially, color. Um, yeah, blue is my favorite color. Yeah. Favorite food or dish. Oh, probably steak. Yeah. I mean, steak or you know. steak or seafood. You know? So you're, you'd be set in Vegas at the, uh, you know, the buffets. Oh Yeah. Ernie surf and turf place is halfway decent. I like me some surf and turf, man. Um, favorite drink. It could be, you know, you're trying to get off the, the hard stuff. So, uh, either coffee or probably for soda sun drop sun drop. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's a sugar uh, bomb, man. Woo. Well, it's not as much as mountain dew. And the guy who taught me how to play drums that lived next door to me, his family owned the, independent bottling company in our town yeah so it was around <laughs> sun drop okay that's very specific yeah. man how about what about your now this is uh this is difficult for a lot of people could your favorite song if this comes on the radio without fail during a, your lifetime you're gonna crank that sucker up oh the one that just i don't know why it jumps forward so quickly but just because it always makes me feel great. Rock and roll doctor by little feet. Okay. Yeah. Just, there's something about that song and there's something about that band that if I was ever in a bad mood or something was going weird, I could put little feet on and I'd feel better. There's just something up about that band. Yeah. You know, 
Yeah, man. And favorite movie. You're going to watch it. Even if it's in the middle. Oh, God. You're going to the last 20 minutes. You're like, sorry, sweetie. I got to finish watching this. Oh, Ooh, you opened up a because that's one of my other loves is movies and books and you know there's music like I was listening to one of my favorite things with Apple Music right now is the Discovery Channel you know like you have the your favorite mix or whatever there's the Discovery mix which is stuff you've never heard on but it's based on your your uh, timeline or whatever yeah yeah I've heard so much stuff that I've never heard before that I love. So that's, you know, side note, favorite movie. Oh, gosh. Recently, it'd probably be Killers of the Flower Moon. I got to see it, man. It, man, I'm such a Scorsese, Tarantino, Christopher Nolan, you know, big, big visuals fan. Yeah. So Oppenheimer is great. Oh, there would be blood is a good one. Oh, it's so dark. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, but I, I like, you know, I like stuff that's art. Then on the other side, you got like anchor man and walk hard or hey, hey, final anchor, tap anchor man. We went through <laughs> a period where we knew how to quote every line from that movie. Oh, for sure. And the office space was another bus movie the same way. Yeah. You know, so I can't wait for spinal tap Two, which they're, they're filming now. I can't wait to see it there because everyone is so much more advanced in age. They're like at least 30 or 35 years older. Yeah, but uh, I, I'm somehow friends with, you know, people are friends on Facebook, even though they've never met, but yeah. you're friends by association of music. Yeah. So I'm friends with CJ Vanston, the keyboard player on, from there. From, and from he Spinal posted Tap? about, yeah. Hilarious. Um, and he posted something about them doing rehearsal. And I, I wrote under his timeline. That hey, if there's ever if there's a bit for drummers auditioning, in Spinal, I said I want in. Yes, I want a chance original, to explode. Oh, because the, the original guy did pass away. Rick Parnell did pass away a couple years ago. Rest his soul. I had actually written him back and forth, you know, being a fan of that movie, and and honestly, his playing. He played with a bunch of p- different people. And Todd has but done it. Bissonette has done it. Yeah, I think it'd be a funny bit to have that in the movie, and then all the drummers have to sign a release, you know, if they're going to die. <laughs> That's right. That's right. My family will not sue Spinal Tap Inc. if I die. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know. Uh, That's a good yeah, one. Yeah, so uh, there's so many different special favorite movies. RoboCop's another one. Oh, okay. You know. That's probably one this- they're going to remake any time now because it's easier for the studios they own the rights to these movies. It's cheaper for them to remake them than buy right. the access to new content. Right. Yeah. Which, you know, I get the economical side of it, but I'd rather see the artistic side. You know, I know PT Anderson's making another movie. And of course, Tarantino's got his last one coming up, whatever yeah. that is. Yeah. And then there's another one. Once upon a time in Hollywood or Jackie Brown strong. You know? Oh, I'm a movie. I'm a geek. <laughs> oh no! Well, hey, well, they, well, we've all got that thing happening. Now you mentioned books. Now you, are you talking like fiction, nonfiction? Um, a little bit of both. Right now, I'm reading Getty Lee's book, My Effing Life. Getting through the third chapter. Have you read it yet at all? Not, not yet. Okay. Uh, the third chapter is all about his family and the Holocaust. Oh wow! So and and their time in the concentration camps of Germany. So that was a little, yeah, that was a little tough to get through uh, having a dad who fought in world war two. And I have visited Dachau before. And Oh yeah. And it's really eerie, you know, because like the smells still there and stuff like that. Oh boy. Um, So I'm reading that I've got uh, the Jeff Picaro book on my table. That Robin Flans did. Yeah, she's already got a second one coming out. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Um, the Rick Rubin book, which Strong. looks pretty cool. Okay. And then I've got a NASCAR book I keep meaning to finish called uh, He Crashed Me So I Crashed Him Back. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a funny like, that's a funny title. Well, that's true in NASCAR. I mean, if you watch any race, you know, if somebody bumps one other one, 
Rubbin's racing and they're going to, or if they wreck them, they'll get revenge next week. Yeah. <laughs> so. Wow. Okay. So this is a, uh, the moral of the story is I've got some books to read and yeah, don't forget about, <laughs> don't forget about reading rich. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, you can get I'm just getting back into it too, man. I mean, my, my could, degrees, my degrees in English. So I did, I read a lot during college. Yeah. <laughs> English <laughs> literature, right? English literature. Yeah. Literature? Yeah. And then I almost taught high school until I went and observed and I went, no, I ain't doing that. <laughs> yeah. Take it from me as someone who, uh, you know, has taught K through 12 as a substitute teacher. Um, patience is a virtue and you spend 90% of your time doing classroom management. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's very difficult and very frustrating. And teachers don't get paid dear enough. No, they oh need my to be, God. No, they do not. And it's a, not oh. a, that's not a good thing, man. No. No. It's, not, it's not a good thing at all. <laughs> Let me tell you what, man. I am so proud of you. And it's likewise, just, man. We've done all right. It's incredible <laughs> to be looking at you and be, you know, 26 years down the line. And you've got this uh, body of work here. You've played with all these people and brought, helped them bring their dreams to fruition, help their, you know, bring their music to the people and music changes lives. And, um, you did it and you bought a house and you've got a balanced life and you're happy and uh it's awesome man well your thing like when, were, was your focus to be a studio guy when you moved no i just wanted to take any work and i knew that i loved teaching i loved it loved recording and i loved touring so i was just going to say yes to everything okay yeah. like my thing was i want somebody to pay me for me to see part of the world <laughs> Oh yeah, my yeah, my mantra was I want to hear myself on the radio, see myself on television, and travel the world on someone else's dime. I wrote that down as a purpose statement. And that's a did, great one too, man. You did the same thing, bro. You <laughs> I saw didn't write the, it down, it was just in my head and yeah. I was like a pinball bouncing off of shit. Like, okay, let's try this. Let's try this. You know? Yeah. It always landed and you just stayed busy and you're still in the game and still learning. The day that we stop learning is the day that we we die. That's that's for sure. That yeah. is really, really true. Yeah, man. Incredible. So what we'll have to do is we will have to get to finally get into the same room at the same time in real time and break some bread, man. I hope we get to do it this year. Y'all have got to be on one of those dates, I hope. <laughs> well, I don't even want to do it backstage at one of those things. I just want to go somewhere where you and I can have two hours and we could just like just be in each other's presence. Well, let me know. I'm around, pal. Uh, we'll make it happen. We'll make it happen this year. You know, like I said, it's pretty, pretty relatively light schedule for this first six months. Our new model is that we tour every June to October. So we do about 50 shows between June and October. And you guys are paid through the year, though, right? Thank like you, talked. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sweet Jesus. Um Awesome, buddy. Well, we'll have to get together. And uh, to all the listeners out there, you want to keep in touch with Lee, Lee Kelly. That's K-E-L-L-E-Y on drums. Lee Kelly on drums dot com. Great uh, website. And you're on, you're it on looks the socials. Like, it, it looks like this. I just got these from Promark. Ooh, that's your uh, SIG stick. Look at that. <laughs> Well, it's it's their forward five A's with I, with my I, name on them. <laughs> I like the I like the forward balance as well, man. Yeah, I do. And you're an Evans guy as well, aren't you? No, I've been a Remo guy. You're a Remo guy. To 1995. Okay. Crazy. I, I couldn't remember if you were both or if you were Remo and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I knew you were a Promark. Well, I knew I wanted to go uh, at you know, and when I ended up hooking up with Promark, it was because I had a friend there that I knew my calls would be answered. So um, <laughs> I was a Regal Tip guy, and then a Johnny Rab guy, and then a Promark guy. Ah, uh, Johnny Rab sticks. Those was some good stuff, though. That was good stuff, man. Yeah, and he his office would used to be where the drum pad is now, which is the teaching facility connected to Drum Paradise, which is pretty yep. crazy. <laughs> hey, so are, are you open to do some teaching or consultations? Are people moving to town? They want to ask questions. How do I do it? Like you did it, Lee. I'm open to that. I mean, I don't know what I would teach as far as drumming goes because yeah. of my limited education in it. Yeah. The only thing I can do is go, here's what I did. That's great. Sometimes you know, that's all you need to pass. Make, on. make sure you can play in time. Make sure you can play a shuffle. Make sure you're not late. Make yeah. sure you show up knowing it, rehearse at home. Yeah. You know, well, the shuffle was the key for your 
a key to entry into the castle. That's how you got the Gary Allen job. <laughs> and all you need is one job. And then people start to talk. And then before you know it, you've had 20 jobs. So great work. Learn the shuffle, kids. Oh, Lee, thanks for being here, man. Thanks for having me, pal. It's been a joy. So cool, Absolute man. Absolute pleasure to do this. <laughs> oh, God, man. You really you really inspired me as well. And uh, to all the listeners out there and to my friend, Jim McCarthy, jimmccarthyvoiceovers.com. Maybe he'll be uh, along for the ride on the next one. Uh, until then, be sure to subscribe, share, rate, review. It helps people find the podcast. And we'll be here. We're always here. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Lee. See you later. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.